So we've been talking about prayer. The great way to remember what prayer is is Matthew 7, chapter 7, verse 7. It says, ask, and what? You shall receive. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open unto you. Uh, you know, one of the things uh, about our new granddaughter, this is a the baby we prayed for for a long time. And... Uh, and asking and seeking. That, that's a great address to remember. Matthew 7, 7 instructs, instructs you about prayer. But then there's a little bit of a challenge. Now that's chapter 7. In chapter 6 of Matthew, that's several verses before on the Sermon on the Mount. In verse 8, Jesus says, Your Father already knows the things that you have need of before you ask. So if God already knows what you need before you ask, why pray? Again, in, uh, uh, Wendy read it this morning in Matthew, the sixth chapter. It says in verse 32, your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. And he's talking about food and clothing and housing. housing. When you read clothing, I said, I thought, I thought you uh, read COVID. Please deliver us from COVID. Uh, I'm, we're, so, we're so tuned in to that. But Jesus said, we, the Father knows what you need before you ask. So why pray? Yesterday I posed that question to the kids at Big Cove Christian Academy. And one little girl raised her hand. She had the most awesome answer. And I, and I wanted to share that with you. If God already knows what we need, why pray? The answer, according to her, was because God loves to hear our voice. Amen. Wasn't that great? That's some good theology. Um, and I got to thinking about that new grandchild that we have. Um, I've only seen pictures of her. There's one picture of her smacking her lips like she's hungry. But I haven't heard her voice yet. And I can't wait to hear her coo and her awe and her cry. And, and because, and I already know what she needs. She needs basically three things, you know. She needs uh, food and, and clothes and uh, someone to change her diaper and some sleep. And so you provide for that, but you want to hear that voice because you love that baby. And God wants to hear your voice. Why? Because he loves you. Your voice has a unique print. Your voice is unlike anybody else's. You know, when you, you call on the phone, you know who it is uh, when they begin to speak because their voice is very distinct. Jesus knows your voice. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows your fingerprint, your thumbprint. He knows everything about you, and he wants you to talk to him because he loves you. So I want to talk to you a little bit about reasons to pray. Oswald Chambers, you know, if you've, anybody's given you one of these devotional books, it's usually one of Oswald Chambers. And he, he says something, he says a lot about prayer, but let me share this short sentence. He says, have no other motive in prayer than to know God. The only motive in prayer, Jesus said, ask, receive, and, and knock, and so forth, but also Prayer is an education. Prayer is an, an enlightenment. Prayer is to get to know God. He hears your voice, and He wants you to tune in and hear His voice and love Him. So, reasons to pray. Number one, in your message outline, it's in your bulletin if you'd like to fill in some blanks. Today's message, reasons to pray. Number one. Prayer renews my confidence that God is at work in my behalf. Let me explain that a little bit. This, underneath that point here, that God, that prayer renews my confidence that God is at work in my life. I thought about Psalm 73. In Psalm 73, the psalmist begins to praise God. It's kind of a prayer. It really is a prayer directed to God. And he has some hard questions he's asking God. 
But before he begins to ask those hard questions of God, he praises the Lord. And I want to encourage you, wherever you are, whatever situation you're facing, good, bad, or ugly, and you're wondering how to start prayer, just start by praising him. Praising him for creation, praising him for loving us, praising him for his kindness. Praise him that he knows the number of hairs on our head, that he knows everything about us, that he wants to direct our path. So praise the Lord. He begins to praise the Lord, and then he begins to unload on God. God, things are going terrible. And I look at these people who care less about God, and they seem to be prospering. They're driving nice cars, and they have nice homes, and everything's going great for them. And look at me. I am full of pain and hurt and sorrow. God, I don't understand. Have I wasted my time trying to be good in life? That's basically what he's saying. And then in verse 16, Psalms 73, verse 16, the psalmist says, When I thought about how to understand this, how to understand how it seems like the wicked are prospering, and, and even though I've tried to do what is right, I am not When I tried to understand this, it was too painful for me. I was trying to understand the world, and I couldn't. It's too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. And then I understood their end. He says, I I did not understand the, the hard things in this life and the pain that I was suffering and going through until I went into the sanctuary of God. And then I understood. Now, what does that mean? Well, I think one thing it means that logic and reasoning cannot explain God. As a matter of fact, the people that try to do that and they stick only with logic and reasoning, they just they 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 sometimes throw in the towel and say, "I can't I can't understand this God thing," and I give up on it. And they're they're agnostics or they're atheists, and they give up. And I'll tell you when. When, when I consider the things of this world, you know, you turn on the TV, watch what's happening in Afghanistan today, you say, and you just, you just slap your head and you think, how, how can this happen? How ugly, how terrible this is. You look at um, the earthquakes in Haiti and see people hurting and suffering. The decisions that are being made that are causing people to lose their lives. Fires and shootings and injustice and bigotry and hatred. And you say, God, what's going on? Logic and reason can't explain that. I've got to go into the sanctuary. I need a deeper insight. I need a, a broader window. I need something to help me to understand. And the psalmist says, I went into the sanctuary of God. I believe one of the things that sanctuary is, is the sanctuary of prayer. Only God can can help you understand. It's, it's a mystery. I don't, I don't think the, the, the battle between good and evil, the, the, the battle that we're fight, facing, the pains and hurts and sorrows that we face in this world, they can't fully be understood. It's the mystery of iniquity that Paul talks about. But if we will go into the sanctuary of prayer, the sanctuary of God, you can begin, the, the, the great controversy between good and evil begins to unfold. And you begin to see the mercy of God. You begin to see the, the, the justice, the, what, the, what the wicked will receive when you go into the sanctuary. When I draw close to God, He draws close to me. And that prayer renews my confidence that God is working in my, ha- in my behalf. So, so going into the sanctuary, let me say it another way. As I open my heart to God, Open my heart to God. How do you open your heart to God? I'm going to let the Holy Spirit apply that. Holy Spirit, help, help us to understand what this means, going into your sanctuary. As I open my heart to God, as I begin to talk to God as I would talk to a friend, I begin to understand. God begins to help me to be at peace. I, I, I learn. What do I learn in the sanctuary? I learn truth. I learn that God has a plan to save man in the sanctuary. It's laid out. God has a plan to save my life. God has a plan to save your life. 
God has a plan for you to have abundant life and eternal life. The sanctuary, as you go into the first part, there's a, there's a washing and then there's a, a cleansing and a, and a sacrifice. But ultimately, what you want to do is go into the presence of God. But the reason that you and I can't go into the very presence of God is because we blew it. It's a thing called sin. We've all sinned. We've all gone astray. We've all turned our backs on God. We've all rebelled against God. And so the wages of sin, the earnings of sin, what do you deserve when you sin? Death. And in the sanctuary, the lamb is sacrificed. And in the sanctuary, the lamb of God, Jesus Christ, is sacrificed. God has a plan for my life. I blew it, we blew it, but Jesus came to pay the penalty for that sin. And so when I have faith, I can have forgiveness and I can have the assurance of eternal life and I can have the assurance that God is working in my behalf. Let's go to the, another reason to pray. Number two. This is, again, it's hard to get your mind around this. I, I can't say that I got my mind around this, but, but here, here it is. God does his work through the prayers of his children. God does his work through the prayers of his children. In the verse underneath this point, I've taken Romans 15:30. And Colossians 4, 3, and I've kind of put them together. You can, you can read them separately. You can look at almost at the end of every, of almost every epistle of Paul. At the end of it, he says, pray for us and pray for this and pray for that. He's always saying pray. Now, why, why does Paul solicit the prayers of people? Notice he says, pray, join in my struggle. You can join somebody in their struggle by praying for them. Join in my struggle by praying to God for me. Pray what, Paul? Pray that I will be rescued from those who refuse to obey God. Pray that God would give us many opportunities to speak about his marvelous plan concerning Christ. And then he says, pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Paul says, look, I'm, I'm preaching the gospel Pray that God would open doors so I'd have a place to preach. Pray that God would uh, take, move, remove the enemies that are trying to destroy me and pray that what I say will come out clearly and people can hear and be saved. Now, I would have to say that because of what Paul has said, he believes that God works through the prayers of his people. Paul believed that the prayers of his friends in Colossae and in Rome, actually, the prayers actually had the power to change his circumstances. God works through the prayers of his people. So, Almighty God, who already knows the end from the beginning, the Alpha and the Omega, the A to Z, Almighty God, accomplishes His will through the prayers of His people. It's hard to get your mind around that. I told the story this week about Jimmy. Jimmy wanted to be a cowboy, and he had uh, chaps and spurs and boots and a hat, and he told his daddy, I want to be a cowboy, daddy, when I grow up. His dad said, okay, that's great. And so, you know, as you grow up, you kind of change. And as he got to be a teenager, he cared a little bit less about uh, the cowboy. And he began, you know, paying more attention to girls and school and so forth. And then finally, he said to his dad one day, Dad, I want to go to college. Dad says, well, I'm sorry, you can't do that. Dad, I want to go to college. Why can't I go to college? He said, because I bought you a ranch and you're going to be a cowboy. We don't have any money left over. So how does God sort all that out? If we, again, if we understood it, we'd be God, right? But we can't understand. 
It's going to be so many thousand years listening to Jesus explain all this. It's going to be great, isn't it? We're going to go to school and hear this. God has set up in the creation of the, this universe, this world, planet Earth especially, so that the way he does things is through the prayers of his people. <laughs> over and over and over in Scripture, it happens that way. So it, it begs the question, when, you've, when you don't pray, when you fail to pray, you know, uh, James says, you receive not because you ask not. So if you don't pray, what happens? It seems like you sort, short-circuit the, uh, God's plans. It's almost if, as if you tie God's hands. Now, God forgive me, I, I don't understand it. I, please, I'm not trying to be re- disrespectful. But God works through the prayers of his people. And we need to be praying. In other words, Paul says, your prayers for me will change my circumstances and save, save people's lives. Folks, we need to be praying. Praying. I, I, I covet your prayers. I pray, I, I, our nation needs prayer. Our city needs prayer. Our neighbor needs prayer. Our marriages need prayer. Our worship service needs prayer. I, I remember the story told about um, Spurgeon. And his church was on fire and growing, and this great preacher, this great man of God, he, and he had a visitor one day, a friend of his, and he's showing him around the church. And they went downstairs in the basement. He said, I want to show you the boiler room. The boiler room. Yeah, that's where the power is, Spurgeon said. So he went downstairs and he opened the door. And there was about 100 people praying. That's where the power is. That's the boiler room. I'll tell you, when, when, when I think about worship service on Sabbath morning and I think about talking about God and what happens here on Sabbath morning and, and we're, we're coming and going and guests are coming and going and we're preaching the word and we're singing, I, we need to pray that God would open hearts and minds and that God would help us to speak clearly and, and minister for Him. God works through your prayers. Keep praying. A third reason we need to pray is that, I love this one, prayer gets things done. Get her done. (laughs) And I've listed several things in your outline, and I'm just going to highlight a couple of them. First of all, prayer defeats the devil. Do you want to kick the devil in the teeth? Yeah, I want to kick him in the teeth. Well, pray. It's the night Peter is about to betray Jesus. Three times, Jesus has been arrested, and Peter says, I don't know him, I don't know him, and then he cusses, and he says, I don't know him. And and Jesus knew this was going to happen. He already knows what you need. And he says, Peter, Peter, let me tell you something. They want to ground and pound you. The devil wants to beat you. He wants to sift you like wheat. But Jesus said, I pleaded for you. I prayed for you. Jesus didn't take a ball, baseball bat or some bolt of lightning and attack Satan. He just began to pray for Peter. Prayer gets things done. Prayer defeats the devil. Prayer saves the lost. You know anybody that's lost? Well, we ought to be quick to pray, right? Quick to pray. Pray first. Prayer gets things done. Prayer saves the lost. Jesus tells a story about two men that go to the temple to pray. Both of them are praying. And one of them, they both talk about their life. And one of them is, ends up being saved, being justified, and the other lost. And the first one is the Pharisee, the religious person. And he goes in, he kind of crosses his hands, and he looks down. The other person is a tax collector. He looks down his nose at the tax collector, and he begins to talk to God. He says, God, I'm glad I'm not a cheater, I'm not a liar, I'm not an adulterer, I'm not a tax collector like this sorry guy next to me. (laughs) What a prayer. (laughs) Maybe he didn't say it exactly that words, but Jesus said, you know, that's, he he was not humble. He was proud. He was arrogant about his righteousness. And then this other man, this tax collector, just begins to beat on his chest and said, God, please be merciful to me, a sinner. And God heard his prayer, and Jesus said, that's the man that went home uh, uh, justified. 
Prayer saves the lost. Now, here's another good one. Prayer restores the backslider. You got some children that are backsliding? You got some parents that are backsliding? You got some friends that you were, they were close with you and close to God, and they're, they've been wandering away? Now, now, if you read the parable of Jesus about the lost sheep, what does the shepherd do? He leaves the 99, he goes and he puts that sheep on his shoulders and he takes it back home. So there are things to do more than just pray, more than just saying words. You gotta go get people. I remember Ron Halverson Sr. telling the story about a backslidden uh, woman and her dad was a minister and Halverson was talking to them. And, and uh, he was going to go visit her. And so he wrote down the address. And when he got there, he found out that she was a prostitute and he had to stand in line before he could talk to her. So he stood in line and finally got there and he said, and he, and he gave her the gospel and she shut the door and went home and was saved and changed forevermore. What a story. Wow. Prayer restores the backslider. Here's what it says in James 5, verse 16. You know this. I think Marlon quoted it in the Sabbath school lesson this morning. So it's in the Sabbath school lesson. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Prayer produces wonderful results. Prayer has power. Power to knock you can go wherever your backslidden friend or relative is through prayer and you can pray for them and ask God to knock on the door of their heart and believe that God will and watch what happens. You know, we, I don't know if they're backslidden or not, but we have a, a lot of people on the church list that are not attending church. And probably some people that we think are active are not quite as active as we think. We need to be praying. The first response is, you know, when they... When they walk through the door, sometimes we say when they come back, wow, you've been gone a long time. Where have you been? That makes them feel good, doesn't it? How about if we say, wow, I'm so glad to see you. I've been praying for you. What a difference that could make. Prayer strengthens the weak. Prayer draws me near to God. And this is for you, nominating committee. The next one is prayer sends workers to the harvest. The most important work, what is the nominating committee? If you're not a, a familiar with that, that is something that, that we do to nominate church officers, elders, deacons, deaconesses, ministry leaders, and we ask them to serve for, is it a year or two years? Two years. It's a lot of work to do that. And what this text says, it says in... in um, Matthew 9, Jesus sees the crowd, and he, you know, I remember sitting on the, the bridge, kind of in a traffic jam, with a friend of mine, he's driving, we're, I don't know where we're going, we're going somewhere, but uh, we're, I was just looking at the, the, the lines of traffic on the, this was, this, this was in Atlanta, I believe, lines of traffic to the left, and lines of traffic to the, to the right, just hordes of people, and I'm thinking, how many of those people don't know Jesus? Jesus is standing on this, uh, and he sees, the, he sees people. He said, they're lost. They're like sheep without a shepherd. We, we've got to do something about it. This is why I came. I came to seek and save the lost. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is great. He sees all these people. He says, the harvest is great. The harvest. When we were in Michigan, I'd never seen so many big apple trees. And right across the street from our house was a huge apple orchard and a huge grape orchard. And I drive to school and I see these apples grow bigger and bigger. Don't tell anybody, but one day I finally went over there and picked one off. Those trees were loaded with apples. Fruit, Jesus says, the harvest. People are ready to be saved. Somebody should say amen real loud. So people are ready to be saved. The harvest is ready. But where are the laborers? How do you get the laborers? You pray for them, Jesus said. Pray. So nominating committee, you got to pray. Church, you got to pray. And when they call you, pray that God would use you. 
Prayer heals the sick. Prayer accomplishes the impossible. Prayer fills with the Holy Spirit. Read the book of Acts. That's what that's all about. That's a handbook on prayer. <laughs> well, let me go back to that story one more time. So Peter and John go to pray. They meet a lame man along the way. And he holds out his palms and he asks for some alms. And this is what Peter did say. Silver and gold have I none, but what I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And so he's leaping and walking and praising God. And then he's thrown in jail because he's praising Jesus. And they want to they wanna get rid of them, but because of the crowd, there would be a riot, and so they don't. Now, this was the day before they had cell phones and body cams and all that. So all this was happening, and the people that were around, it says uh, in that story that after Peter preached that sermon, there were 5,000 believers. So it looks like 1,000 or two people were there and believed and received Jesus when Peter was preaching. And this, this, was, this was driving the religious authorities who had crucified Jesus crazy. And so they're out there saying, don't do this anymore. You can't teach in Jesus' name anymore. And Peter says, well, I'm going to obey you or, or I'm going to obey God. And, and so I'm going to obey God. And so they send them on their way. So they go back to where the other disciples are. This is the last part of the story. They go back to the other disciples. They haven't sent them a text message or a photograph to tell them what's happening. They go and then they begin to tell. This is what happened. We went to the temple. We got arrested. We preached Jesus. And, and we got to testify of Christ. And when, Peter hears, when the people hear what Peter has to say and John have to say, they begin to pray. And they begin to praise God. And they say, this is prophesied. The nations would rise up, rise up against the Messiah. This is what has happened to Jesus. And they pray, Lord, please give us more miraculous sign and help us to speak boldly for Jesus. And when they said that, the building where they were began to shake. Now, it wasn't an earthquake because I guess the, 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 the roof didn't collapse on them. But the presence of God shook the place. And it wasn't, they weren't shaking so they could be entertained or run around and jump and scream and holler and roll and all that stuff and speak in tongues. I'm sorry if, if you, uh, I'm not trying to be critical, but I'm saying that's not the reason the Holy Spirit fell. The Holy Spirit fell but to send them on a mission to preach Jesus, to tell the world that Jesus is the Savior of the world, and He's died for them. And they can have forgiveness and have eternal life. Prayer. Prayer gives us the confidence that God is, is working. God, prayer makes it clear. God, prayer helps us understand God is working. Prayer is the way that God, uh, God works through the prayers of His people, through your prayers. What's the third one? Prayer gets things done, right? Gets things done. Gets things done. And prayer is the most important work you can do. Let's pray. Father, just to think that our prayers are heard in heaven. You know our address, you know when we pray, you hear our, our mild little voice, or, or you hear our trouble that we're facing. Lord, help us to be bold and come into the sanctuary of prayer so that we can find confidence and know that you're working for us, that we can see things done, that people will be saved. Lord, shake our lives, shake our church. Um, help us to be a soul-winning uh, church that's filled with the Holy Spirit that people are drawn to that because we are drawn to people because we love people. Lord, help us to pray. Teach us to pray. Pray with me this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation. 
Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.